Welcome everyone to a webinar that hasn't happened in a while. We've brought our friend and uh, I, I guess client Chris Hunrath back to talk about PCB laminate materials for high speed and RF design. This webinar is brought to you by Advanced Assembly, AAPCB.com, Royal Circuit Solutions, RoyalCircuits.com, and Inselectro, Inselectro.com. If you have any questions after the webinar, we will post this. Um, well, let me say two things. One, if you have questions as we go through the webinar, feel free to ask them. After the webinar, we will post this recording within two business days at the blogs of probably aapcb.com and royalcircuits.com. And then we will give you some emails that you can use to ask us more questions because there's going to be a lot of information contained today. As we go through, and Chris, if you just click the little link there for me, uh, you're going to see a thing for Q&A down in the bottom. Please use the Q&A as we don't normally monitor chat for questions. It just gets a little bit much. And with that, let's get going. Royal Circuits and Advanced Assembly have been in the quick turn PCB manufacturing and assembly business for the last 20 years. Our whole business model is meant around low prototype to production level PCBs. We'll make anything from one to you know 10,000 boards a month for you, whatever it is that our customers need. But our real goal is to make them faster than anybody else. We get parts overnight from all the major, major manufacturers. We have laminates and all the PCB board materials on hand. We oftentimes don't even have to order things to get, to get production started on your design. So if you have anything, if you need it fast, feel free to reach out to Royal Circuits and Advanced Assembly. Just so you know, we are located all over the United States. We've got a rigid PCB manufacturing facility in Hollister, California, where we focus on the uh, basically the rigid designs. Flex and rigid flex in Southern California, where we still make some rigid boards, but mostly we're trying to focus on uh, some of the flexible rigid flex, um, flex with stiffeners, that sort of thing. And then we fly everything overnight to Advanced Assembly in Aurora, Colorado, where we're centrally located for distribution. While those boards are being made, we're collecting your parts. We uh, have it all ready to go the second those boards get offloaded off the plane, and then we'll get those things populated all again in a matter of hours. Uh, you know, we, we sometimes do things in as little as one shift. Um, just incredible, incredible quick turns that we sometimes call miracle turns. Now, the reason some of you joined, I promised you $500 off and I've got it for you. We've got the webinar code webinar2021, nice and easy to remember, that you can use on any order that you place through advanced assembly, quick turn, PCB, um, not quick turn, I'm sorry, um, turnkey service through advanced assembly. Uh, so turnkey, if you are, give us your design files, everything, we'll get the parts for you, we'll get the boards for you, all of that, and we'll give you $500 off. And if you talk to our sales associate, usually there's uh, a few other discount codes floating around too that we can maybe help you out with. So write that down and we'll also email it to you after the webinar. With that, I am very, very happy to introduce the encyclopedia of, of material science, Chris Hunrath of Inselectro. Chris, welcome. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, thanks for all the compliments. Um, so Inselectro is a material science company. Um, I mean, that, we supply all kinds of electronic materials. So, so laminates, prepregs, uh, various resin systems, which you'll hear more about today. Uh, the flex circuit materials, metal foils, uh, interconnecting paste, uh, capped on film, uh, thick film uh, polymers, fired on polymers, you know, uh, just all those materials. But if it's, if it's electronics related and it's a, it's a raw material for making circuits, uh, whether it's printed electronics, flex circuits, or rigid PCB, uh, we've, got, we've got products in that space. And it's, it's not just what we do, it's our passion. Uh, we try and make it um, very easy for our customer base to get materials when, when fabricators, I'm sorry, when OEMs place orders or contract manufacturers place orders with our customer base, 
we try and make sure we've got stock. Uh, we have 12 locations and just like I said, it's the voodoo that we do. And you guys do it so well. Yeah. And we, we try and up our game all the time, you know, uh, you know, through our, our technical people, we have technical people in the field. Um, we have uh, local inventory, you know, again, across our 12 branches in North America. Uh, we provide process chemistries, uh, you know, just, and again, all the, all the know-how and we, we try and be problem solvers for our customer base. So uh, right. Isola, DuPont, LCOA, these are all the different uh, suppliers that we, uh, that we represent. All right, Chris. So what is it that you hope to hope for us to accomplish today? Really to help, uh, help your customer base make sense of all the different materials that are available. So, um, you know, Mark, you and I've talked about this in the past, you know, it's, it's, it's a changing landscape with materials. Right. And I mean, when I first got started, uh, you know, in PCB design, I would make stuff and then I would give it to my boss. My boss would correct the many, many, many mistakes I made. And then, you know, he took care of all the board ordering. Then they get a little older and, you know, all of a sudden I'm, I'm in charge of board ordering. And for the longest time, again, you know, I would just take it and I kind of, you know, toss it over to the wall to a, a manufacturer, you know, like, royal or or whatever and i would let them figure everything out and then i got a little better you know now i'm doing impedance control designs well now i need to have a conversation with the manufacturer you know uh, figure out what materials what the stack up's going to look like so i can do some impedance control but even then i'm still mostly messing around with fr4s but man things things just keep getting faster um RF is on everything these days, you know, every, you know, what doesn't have Bluetooth or Wi-Fi anymore, especially in the IoT space. And it, it just gets all confusing. I mean, there's so many things to choose from. It, it, it's kind of like going to the supermarket and looking at the milk aisle, right? You know, which one do you choose? It, it's an abundance of, and that's probably not even the best example, but there's an abundance of choices and, and you just don't even know really where to start sometimes, which one's right. better, which one's worse. So how do I know all this, man? Yeah. And, and that, you know, it's a great point because RF is everywhere because so many things are wireless, right? So, so, you know, it wasn't that long ago, you didn't have to worry about that. And then of course, even in the digital part, you know, things like signal skew, you know, I mean, when you did those designs on FR4, did you worry about signal skew? It's Gosh, because, no. Yeah, it's because it's the speeds weren't there. Uh, but, you know, impedance control has always been, I shouldn't say always, because I remember when I first started, we didn't worry about impedance. And then I remember when boards were coming in, we'd have this special tag that said impedance controlled. And now pretty much everything is, right, to, to some degree. Um, but yeah, signal loss, speeds, all these things are, are important. And, of course, you know, we're trying to manage all this and, and make the cost reasonable, you know, both on the material side and on the fabricator side, we, we you know, we try and make, you know, deliver the performance needed for the design without having the cost go crazy. And certainly there are high cost options that have very high performance, but they're not going to be uh, suitable for every, every application. So really that's what we try and do is we try and help make sense of out of all this. That's where this presentation today is going. Um, there are options at all, multiple levels, and we'll talk, we'll talk more about this as we go through this. All right. Well, hey, I'm excited to learn more. So really cost versus performance to meet your requirements. So, okay. So my understanding of printed circuit boards, or at least, you know, your typical FR4, you've got fiberglass that's coated with epoxy and copper gets laminated on either side of that. Now, if it's laminated at the factory, you know, it, you know, so let's see, I sold this factory, you know, it, it comes to us and, and we see a core material, a little sandwich. And if, if it's not, if it comes to us as, you know, raw materials so that we can make a, a sequential stack up, we would call that, you know, um, I just lost it pre-preg. There we go. Um, but that's kind of the, let's say the extent, I know there's different fiberglass weaves. I know there's different epoxies. I know there's different thicknesses of copper. Um, but when it comes to choosing them, that's where things get a little fuzzy. Uh, I, I like to use the analogy for mechanical engineering, right? Any idiot can build a, a bridge that stands. It takes an engineer to build a bridge that barely stands, right? That barely works. And that's kind of where I'm at. I'm, I'm the any idiot that can make a board work, 
but I'm not doing it economically. I'm not doing it cheaply. I'm not doing it smartly. Uh, I'm over-engineering. So help me out, man. Yeah. So, so in the case of rigid materials, these basic building blocks are somewhat the same, um, but you can change the, the chemistry of them, right? Well, copper, the copper stays the same, although that's not entirely true. And we'll talk more about that as we go through this. So really, when we look at look at higher speed designs, we we care about we care about the signal loss um, because that that can change everything, right? So um, we look at the the total loss, which is a combination of the dielectric and the uh, dielectric. I'm sorry, and the conductor, um, and they're both they both need to be considered. Now, when low loss materials started coming out, uh, the earlier materials like the cyanide cyanide ester based ones. Uh, so some of the name brands that people might be familiar with, uh, those early materials typically use standard copper. And at that point, it was OK because you got the you got the performance you needed. The problem is, is as speeds go up, that's no longer enough. Um, so we have to consider both the both the dielectric material and the um, and the copper foil. Now, the the. Um, the energy you lose in these materials is very small, but but it adds up and that's part of why it's uh, well, why it's so important. Um, and of course, the same circuit at higher speeds will have higher loss. So let's just say I have an FR4 material, I have a four inch transmission line, right? It may work totally fine at two gigabits, but as I go higher in frequency, you know, that, that, that response starts to flatten out, loss increases and it may not function. Okay, so, you know, you said as you go up in frequency, um, when do I need to start worrying about, you know, either let's say data rate or if I'm doing RF frequency, at what point do I need to start paying attention to my materials? So it, it depends on your loss budget, but you know, FR4, you're going to be thinking about a higher performance material somewhere in the three to five gigabit range. And, and people who use gigabit gigahertz interchangeably, they're really not interchangeable, but you know, Typically, when we talk about data transmission, we're talking about gigabits, and for RF, we're talking about gigahertz. Um, but you know, in the in that range, you know, the three to five gigabit range, you know, you st should start thinking about something other than FR4. Um, but when you get above ten giga uh, gigabits, or in case of RF, gigahertz, uh, now you're starting to talk about a frequency that that um, that produces a skin depth, and for most people. I think are familiar with um, uh, the skin depth effect. As you go higher in frequency, the signal travels on the surface of the trace. But when the roughness reaches the free or reaches the uh, wavelength, then you then you start really seeing an increase in loss. So we want smoother coppers, and and that happens, you know, from standard RTF copper that happens at about 10 gig. So that's where you start to think about. You have to start thinking about not only do I need a lower loss resin system, I need to you know use smoother coppers. And we do supply smoother coppers on a variety of our laminates. So I'll, I'll talk more about that. We also sell that so that foil individually. So if you're doing buildup technology, that's where you where you will start with some sort of a core, laminate a layer, and then uh, you know drill laser drill plate image, and then repeat that uh, multiple times. Um, you know we have the foils for that as well. So that's the the hard cutoff things at about 10 gigahertz. I wouldn't call it a hard cutoff at all. It, it's really a progression. And again, it goes back to your design and your application and how, how loss tolerant you are. Um, but, you know, it's it, at, above that, you really need to start considering the conductors. Okay. And then for those of you that might not remember skin effect from school, um, as, as you approach higher and higher frequencies, you start getting these eddy currents set up in the body of the conductor, which basically forces all of your signal to travel along the surface of the conductor. If you'd look in the bottom left-hand corner, you can see that there's a much larger um, surface area. And uh, Chris, does that mean then that the signal has to travel a further distance? No, actually a, a better analogy is you're radiating more of the signal into the dielectric. You're, you're increasing the surface ah. area of the conductor. So it's a, it's a radiating effect. And then what happens is, is some of that energy gets converted into, uh, into heat energy and it's lost. Now on a per, per signal basis or per, per bit basis, it's tiny, but you're talking about billions of these, you know, uh, uh, ups and downs in the, in the digital wave, you know, per second. 
it adds up and that's where that's where that's why your you know devices get hot you know it's the loss signal loss that makes sense okay and by the way just for our attendees out there this does not need to be a chris and mark show um if you have questions feel free to ask them in the q a area and uh we'll work them into the webinar if we can or ask them at the end yeah just as a side note the fabricators would would intentionally roughen the copper to get better adhesion uh and and it does produce better adhesion um the important thing to remember is is when the circuit's embedded inside the pcb you don't need high peel strengths it's a little different on the surface layer and i've actually seen people specify one kind of copper internally and another kind of externally um, because they want the, the better adhesion for where they're going to be putting the components um, there's there's a lot of different things happening on that front too and that's probably the subject of another webinar but um, you know that that's why the copper would be roughened is to get to get better adhesion how do you specify that chris uh, well great question so and the IPC is just releasing some new guidelines on copper foil. So that's something to stay tuned on. Uh, but, um, you know, there are terms like HVLP, VLP2. Um, there are different terms out there that are not IPC terms, IPC terms. Um, so, so RTF foil is what they call reverse tree foil, where you have a drum side. And I, I should probably back up. When you're talking about electrodeposited foils, you have a drum side, which is smoother and a, and a solution side, which is rougher. So you have, imagine this giant drum, you know, a metal drum rotating in a, in a copper bath, copper plating bath, and you're depositing copper foil, you know, you're driving the copper ions through electricity and you're plating the foil. And as the, as the drum comes out of solution, you're peeling the foil off. Um, so you have a shiny side and, and a rougher side. Then it goes through a secondary treatment where they add the copper nodules and that's done for adhesion. And there's some other tricks and technology they have and coatings and whatnot to make it stick. But um, with RTF, they put the nodules on the, on the drum side. So the rough side's up, the nodule side is down. And that, when you get the laminate, the copper has a matte finish. Uh, very good for imaging, you know, for applying your photoresistant imaging. Uh, better for etching in terms of finer lines. Uh, but it is rough. And so now we have foils that are what we call HVLP, for, which stands for hyper, very low profile. And then we have the VLP2, which is very low profile to micron. They're equivalent. They're not identical. Actually, the VLP2 is a bit smoother than the, than the HVLP. Uh, but typically, when, when we see people order laminates, they'll put one of those designators on that. All right. Uh, well, what are we looking at here, buddy? So this is just kind of an overview of the resin systems that have been traditionally used in, in, um, in PCBs. This doesn't cover everything. Uh, I mentioned earlier cyanate ester, but the multifunctional epoxy, epoxy systems, they went through kind of a change or an evolution around 2006 when lead-free assembly became popular, uh, but they're still used today. Um, those, are, those are phenolic cured epoxies. And then, of course, polyamide. Polyamide's been around for a long, long time. You know, I remember us building boards back in the early 80s for Bendix out of polyamide. Uh, any of the old timers on this, uh, this webinar might remember Bendix as, a, as an OEM. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the PTFE systems down at the bottom, uh, they've been around a while, too. Uh, they were used for, for RF applications and the high-speed systems. But now we have these the polyphenol and oxide are sometimes called PPO systems uh, and PPE blends um, that allow us to get to PTFE electricals without some of the drawbacks. And uh, again, these are composite materials. So we do that with a combination of, of the right type of glass and the right type of copper. Interesting. If we could go back for just a second. Um, sure. I'm just curious, right? You know, who develops these things? Are, are there universities out there where professors are sitting around doing material science? I mean, how, how do these new and, you know, the latest, greatest things get developed? Well, that's an interesting question. So, you know, there are companies out there that develop resin chemistries. Um, some of the resins that we deal with have their roots in, in the composites industry. And when I say composites, remember PCB materials are composites by themselves, 
but we have a whole nother industry of composites where they're used everything from aircraft to body armor, right? Uh, yeah. where, you, where you mix these different materials. So some of the resin chemistries were invented for other applications and they find their way into PCB. Some were developed specifically for PCB. You know, polyphenol and oxide resins have applications in other, other markets, uh, but they have some, some very good low loss properties and they've been um, uh, adapted to use in PCBs. So to better answer your question, it's really the laminate suppliers who are doing the R&D right now. On these uh, on these systems, well, sometimes in 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 combination with a with a large OEM, um, there are some OEMs out there that work on joint development projects. And I'm going to talk about a a product in a little bit that was developed with Bosch, um, you know, for the electric vehicle market. Uh, that's so that's an example where an OEM partners partners with a material supplier and they they work together on the development of a new system. Now that's interesting. You know, you were saying that these things come in from other industries and, you know, other, other inventions. I, I guess I hadn't really considered that, but I mean, that's how most things come about, right? Incremental improvements or somebody discovers something and then it finds application. By the way, incremental improvement is so key to this business, this technology. And it's an important reason why we need to keep making circuit boards in the U S we, we don't want to lose that, that, that incremental development in electronics technology. And the boards are becoming so critical to the overall uh, performance of a system. Absolutely. And a lot of people are finding with some of the offshore suppliers that uh, they're not maintaining the same quality that we do over here. And, uh, you know, sometimes they're risking their IP. Oh, no, not sometimes, Chris. They are risking their IP. Right, well, true, true <laughs> that, yes. Okay, so um, I've got a buddy um, he's a good friend and he works in ultrasonics and he was asking me the other day, how do you call out a, a material, you know, for a stack up? Let's, you know, when do you choose 1080, 106? Can, can, is it different from manufacturer to manufacturer, right? If he orders from, uh, Royal, if he orders from somebody else, um, they might have different, a, a different laminate supplier, a different foil supplier. How does he call that out? Can he just use slash sheets and just say, you know, uh, give me 4101 slash 103 or, or whatever it is. And then the suppliers figure it out from there. How does this all work? Yeah. And I, my best answer for that is it depends. Um, you know, if you, if you have a good understanding of what your part needs and it's, let's just say it's an epoxy based system, lead free assembly, you can use a slash sheet in certain circumstances, but not all materials are identical, even if they meet the sl same slash sheet. I'll give you a great example. We have two materials, 370HR and 408HR. They both meet the same slash sheets, very different signal performance between the two materials. So the slash sheets only cover some basic attributes of the material. Um, so it's, it's not, you know, it's a starting point is probably a better way to say it rather than the, the end all, you know, some of my customers go through, uh, you know, audits with their, with their, uh, customer base. And they ask for my help on things like, well, I need ANSI codes for all the different materials. Well, some of the materials don't have ANSI codes because they're newer materials. You know, they have, they don't have that, you know, that, that GF or, or, or G, you know, uh, GI or GPY designation, like some of the older materials had. And some of those are not only ANSI codes, some of them go back to the mill 13949. Um, again, some of the older folks on this call might recognize some of those uh, specifications that have all been replaced by the IPC. But really what people should do is, is contact, you know, the, the likes of Royal Circuits and say, hey, I'm trying to do this. What do you recommend? Because they have some pretty good information on that, pretty good insight into that. And then we can always help too. So and, point someone in the right direction. And yeah, we just yeah. need to know, we need to know a few things, you know, about what you're trying to accomplish. In the case of ultrasonics, you may not want FR4 if it's phenolic cured, because that material tends to be more brittle. So that would be, you know, we might recommend a different material that has a, you know, uh, a higher fracture toughness and lower modulus. But again, both materials might meet the same spec, but not all the different attributes you're looking for in the particular design. Okay, I'm going to tell you something else about my friend. Uh, when we had this conversation, one of the first questions he asked, and I, I probably should have led with this, is, hey, Chris, what's a slash sheet? Hmm. 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> good, good question. Yeah, so, so the IPC rigid material specification, and there's one for flex. I have, I have a couple of different specifications up here, uh, but the 4101, which is a specification for rigid material base materials, um, they will have some o an overview of quality and other specifications, performance specifications. But then within that document, <clears throat> typically at the end, you'll have a listing of what they call these slash sheets or uh, these different specification sheets. And you can see an example here on the bottom. This is for lead-free compatible FR4. What makes something lead-free compatible is it has a higher decomposition temperature. So it survives lead-free assembly better. Um, it's epoxy based. Uh, in this case, the slash 98 also says it will have inorganic fillers. So they separated out filled and non-filled material that also created a whole big, because that separation happened, I think with the adoption of the rev, rev D of the document, that was a whole nother story, but yeah, it's got some basic information here. Um, so you can see, uh, in the example, uh, where it says 4101 slash 98. So, um, and then, then there's, you know, you might have a slash 26 or a slash 134, um, depending on the type of material it is. And basically it just, again, it, it has some basic information. It's epoxy is a primary resin system. It's multi multifunctional epoxy. It has a bromine flame retardant. So you'll see for halogen free materials, you'll see a different slash sheet because they don't contain bromine. So for those of you new designers out there, I absolutely understand that IPC keeps a pretty good copyright lock on all of their stuff, and you might never have heard of Slash Sheet before. Um, you don't necessarily have to. Get in touch with us. We can walk you through it. Or um, Chris, your website at Isola, I'm sorry, no, it didn't Selectro. You guys still have um, the materials divided up by Slash Sheet, don't you? Right. Don't you have yeah, and actually, this this is a product comparator. Again, it's not we sell, you know, somewhere in the rigid side. We sell somewhere around 30, 35 different resin systems, but there's nine we sell uh, sell in volume, and this is a this is a a section of that. You know, this is the six of most popular that we sell, um, and this is just kind of a cheat sheet where you have some basic information, including the slash sheets. Uh, note that the polyphenol and oxide systems uh, have two different slash sheets. They reference the, the 4101 or, or specifications, I should say, and the 4103. But this is just a really good guide to, to, to get you, um, you know, an, an idea of where you might want to go. So I have the GPS speed, speed limit, which, again, is very subjective. Uh, I have customers running forward HR up, up in the 20 gigabit range because their design, you know, is such where their traces aren't excessively long and, uh, and they can tolerate that in their design. But this is just a kind of a, kind of a, you know, uh, just an overall guide. You know, uh, I'm looking over at the material cost factors right now. Um, I mean, until you get into like the Astra, I mean, these things aren't as bad as I thought. Yeah, and you get a pretty significant speed benefit. I mean, I speed, I think for the cost, you know, provides a, a 006 DF. It provides, you know, quite a bit of value. Um, and iTerra, I've, I've seen people go with Teflon boards. In fact, I just had something recently where someone wanted to combine a Teflon or PTFE based material with polyimid for an aerospace application. And, uh, and, we looked at the we looked at the requirements and the parameters, and we said, "Look, just make a pure package Itera. It's simpler to build. It, it's less expensive to build. Everybody benefits. The fabricator benefits. The OEM benefits because they get something that's you know um, that has all the attributes they want, and it's it, they could you know they can get it more easily." And material cost. We're not talking about overall cost of the project. We're just talking about material cost. Most of the money, well, not most, but plenty of the money in PCB fab is tied up in processing. Right, and and the nice thing about uh, Terra Tachyon and Astra, and and to some degree, F, uh, four weight HR and I speed, they process like three seventy HR. Yeah, the lamination temperature is ten or so degrees higher, but pretty much everything else processes like FR four. Whereas PTFE, you have to use a special plasma cycle. You have to be careful in plating. You know, there's a lot of things you have to watch out for. Uh, oh, and by the way, the material, because it's a thermoplastic and it's soft, you know, you've got to worry about movement. 
So there's a, you know, in, in the fabrication process. So yeah, there's a lot to be concerned with. So um, yeah, there's a lot of opportunity for these, uh, these guys. And we're seeing, we're seeing some really nice growth on these products. I would like to remind our listeners as you go through this, feel free to ask uh, questions in the Q&A at any time. I will either answer them um, as we go along or we can save them to the end and uh, answer them live on the air. So ask away. I know this is uh, some deeply technical stuff and not all of us are Chris Hunrath. In fact, there's only one Chris Hunrath and we've got him. <laughs> I think that's a good thing though. <laughs> I don't, buddy. I wish I wish there were more people like you and Eric Bogatin and Rick Hartley and Susie Webb in the world. Uh, it would yeah, be a no, better place. Yeah, and, and you know, as as uh, you know, as us folks, you know, uh, um, you know, hang around the industry for a while, and then maybe some of us move on. We need new folks to take the reins. Absolutely. So uh, I, I I wish we had more people coming into the industry because I think it's I think it's a great thing. Um, and some of our customers have done a really good job with that. They brought in, you guys, you guys have brought some young folks into the industry. We need to bring some new blood into the, into the, um, into the PCB world. Well, um, I am looking at our participant list right now and I see three, I mean, there's a lot of names I don't recognize. So there could, there could be more than that, but I see three, uh, professors on with us right now. Nice. Yeah. So thank you for joining us. All right. So, um, what are we looking at here? Yeah, so I talked about our 12, our 12 stocking branches that we have across North America. Um, really, what I want to just introduce the idea is, is on standard materials. So um, certainly there are materials that, that, so let me back up. All the materials we have, we have these DKDF charts where it lists every construction uh, of every building block you would have for a multi-layer PCB. So... Um, for a given thickness or a given glass for the prepreg, and just again, just to refresh everyone's memory, we, we call it prepreg. It basically it's it's fiberglass fabric that's uh, pre-infused with uh, with the resin of choice. Um, they do come in different varieties, and they have very good reasons why they come that way, um, because you might need different characteristics for your particular design. So when we make a PCB. One of the things we have to do is we have to make sure it is um, it has a certain level of integrity in the construction, so you can go through assembly and, of course, it, even post assembly, the part has to you know um, you know survive well, perform well, you know, both mechanically and electrically. So, um, depending on the design, you'll have different copper features, and those need to be fully encapsulated and bonded and all the other good stuff. So, so we have a variety of prepregs and a given resin system and glass style with different resin contents. They all have their purpose. I know the folks at Royal Circuits who do stack ups are very well versed in this. What we try and encourage people to do is pick standards, pick stuff we have in stock. It's better for everybody. You get your parts faster, typically at a lower cost. Um, and we, we have enough variety where you're not locked into something that's very restrictive. Um, so two examples I have here is the prepreg or the, or the, you know, the, the bonding sheet, glue, whatever you want to call it. Uh, we have a low resin content and high resin content. And then in the case of five core, we have a single ply construction and a two ply construction. And there are cases where you'd want to use one over the other. And what you can see here on this chart is they do have slightly different electricals. Um, you'll have a, a, a little lower decay on the higher resin and a little lower loss on the higher resin, but you'll have a uh, higher cost on that core a little bit, not crazy, but it will be, it will cost more. Also, too, you'll have higher uh, coefficient of thermal expansion on the uh, higher resin core. I'm not saying don't use the higher resin core. Just know what you're getting depending on the design. And again, we tend to have two options or two flavors. There might be five for a particular thickness. There might be five options available, but the other ones are special order. So just, just be aware of it. Just be aware that if you can, you can build, pick the standard building blocks, um, you'll benefit from... Um, from faster or shorter lead times and lower cost. And then of okay. course I got some pictures on the, in the lower left there of, of different fiberglass uh, cloths from very fine to, to coarse at the, at the bottom. All right, so I've got a question and then we've got one from one of our attendees that fits in here pretty well too. So my question would be, 
when would I use or select something with a higher resin versus a lower resin? Where do those fit in the stack up? Uh, well, typically, if you're using heavier coppers or thicker coppers, you'll need the higher resin content to properly fill and encapsulate all the areas where you've removed copper for your circuit design. Um, so typically, they're, you know, higher power circuits or power and ground planes, you might need higher resin content to properly fill those, uh, those areas that have been removed of copper. Um, there are some cases where people are looking to, you know, get a little lower dielectric constant. Um, Although you're probably better off tweaking your design on the trace width rather than trying to, to change the, uh, the resin content. The resin content's more for construction purposes than it is for electrical purposes. Okay, Not that, that it can't be used for both. That makes sense. All right, so our question is, um, and I'm just gonna read it. Why are fab houses not keeping 408 HR stocked? I have had several no bid because they don't keep the material on hand. Are other materials taking its place? So 408 HR is an older, lower loss option for FR4. It's actually, as I mentioned earlier, it's the same slash sheet as FR4, but it is lower loss. So I'm going to go back to that um, comparator here real quick. Um, 408 HR is very much available. We stock it in our branches. We stock a lot of it, but not every construction is available all the time because we stock based on customer forecasts and intel we get from our customer base. Um, and it may, there may be a case where someone has a large project and they buy everything we have on our shelf. Now, it doesn't happen often, but it does happen sometime, sometimes. And then, of course, our customer base, some of them will have the, the material in their stock. If, we don't, if they don't have it and we don't have it, um, then we would go to the factory and have it made. And fortunately, the Chandler uh, factory for Isola is up and running now, so we can have pro product make, uh, made there. They're increasing their output, you know, as they ramp up the factory, so they're not at full production yet. But we can go there for, you know, for some quicker turn stuff. Um, so I'm not sure why someone doesn't have the material available. Um, and is it something that was special made? Is it heavy copper? Is it an unusual construction? I don't know. I know Royal has it. The only thing I can think of is, um, you know, you can't leave this stuff sitting on the shelf in, in the storage closet forever. Um, you know, after about a year, we toss stuff that hasn't been used. Um, maybe they're getting rid of it and they haven't had enough of an MOQ to justify buying more. I don't know. Royal's got it. So come see us. Yeah, the, the, that by the way, the shelf life's more true for the prepreg than it is for the uh, for the cores. Oh, uh, it, as long as the copper, as long as the copper is kept from you know getting badly oxidized, and it does have an anti tarnish protection. Uh, the cores technically don't have a shelf life. It's the prepregs. The prepregs can have a shelf life, and that can be a big issue because you know, uh, let's face it, how many double sided boards do people build anymore? True, but um, let's let's just not tell the boss that because I might have thrown some stuff away, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. What's so, the latest, uh, greatest in thermal laminates, my friend? Yeah. So, so we've got some new products coming out there. Uh, there's Terra Green 400 G, which, uh, which, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about. I don't have a slide on that one, but that's a, that's a new law loss, la low loss laminate that's coming out for the next generation of high speed stuff. But, this one I'm pretty excited about because I've worked with my customer base on some, some interesting boards. This was the one that was developed with Bosch uh, and Isola. It's based on a completely new resin chemistry called benzoxacine. Now, when I say completely new, it's new to the PCB industry. Benzoxacine has been around, I would say commercially for about 20 years. Now that might sound like a long time, but it is somewhat younger than epoxy and polyimide. Um, I think most of the folks on this call have come in, come in contact with an application uh, because this is what composite aircrafts are made out of. So, you know, uh, uh, commercial airplanes are being made more and more out of composites and less and less out of aluminum. And benzoxacine is the resin they're using. Now, the fiberglass is completely different and it has to have some other, other different properties. But it, it, what's nice about it is it's got great fracture toughness. It withstands temperature cycling very well. And notice that the calf resistance, 1500 volts at a thousand hours calf test, that's really impressive. So the standard test, IPC test is 10 volts. And then there's another test that's, that's been very commonly used at hundred volts. 
uh, in the PCB industry, this went at 1500 volts. Chris, that's, um, you know, orders of magnitude improvement. What's different about this stuff that's, that's allowing it not to experience these calf failures? Yeah, well, again, it's based on that new resin chemistry, benzoxacine. It's also, um, by the way, this is also halogen free um, and it's 94 V0, uh, but it's, um, it's got great fracture toughness. And what that means is, is both in the way it cures and um, in the way it responds to mechanical stress, it's not going to form cracks. Um, and those cracks are pathways that could cause uh, an issue. It also sticks to the fiberglass very well. So you're not creating those pathways, but you can see in the images, those, those red circles where some of the, some of the fractures have been highlighted. <clears throat> and those become bigger challenges when you're dealing with heavy copper, because you end up with a lot of neat resin. So, um, in other words, resin that's been extracted from its glass, and in some cases, even the filler. That's the part that goes and fills the gaps between the copper circuits. Hmm. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm looking over here at the the text on the slide, uh, and I'm looking at the, the point that says withstands long thermal exposures, RTI 150. What's that? So... Um, Relative thermal index or maximum operating temperature have been used somewhat interchangeably and how the testing is done is a little bit differently, but that really refers to the operating temperature. <clears throat> Most FR4s have an RTI of either 120 or 130 Celsius. Now, the difference between 120 and 150 doesn't sound huge, but when UL does the RTI testing, they put the board through thermal accelerated thermal aging and most materials come out looking black. Um, now, when a material loses some of its electrical properties and some of its mechanical properties, and I believe it's 50% of its mechanical strength, it's considered dead. So um, that all gets worked back into a formula and that's where they calculate you know, the RTI or the maximum operating temperature. And 150C, we only, have, we only sell one other material that exceeds that. We have something called Pyrolux HT, Henry Tom, and that has a, uh, an operating temperature of over 200 C. Hmm. But even a lot of polyimids are only rated at 140. So uh, the RTI of 150 is good. And I, I just, just had an application come across me last week where a customer needed a 145 RTI. And it was this material that met their spec. Huh. Um, okay. So I guess I never really considered with CAF, you know, the, for people who don't know what we're talking about, this is um, conductive anodic filament. Basically, uh, little little bits of copper start creating a, you know, basically creating a wire that connects the anode and the cathode, and it creates a short circuit, and um, it releases the magic smoke. I never really considered that it's following crack lines. Uh, I, I assume it's also following some of the fiberglass, you know, between the fiberglass and the epoxy and, you know, creating holes there. What, I mean, I've got so many questions, but let me just start with this one because one of our, our listeners has this. Um, 1500 volts for a thousand hours. How close were the vias when you guys, con or when they conducted this test? Do you know how, what was the spacing? Yeah, good question. And I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to get back to your, your, uh, um, person on that. Um, I know the some of the test vehicles, the, the spa conductor spacing is somewhere in the order of 12 mils, but I, I need to verify that in this case. Okay. And then also, I'm sure they would want to know layer to layer spacing um, if they did that as well. So Dominic, we're going to have to not know for now, but uh, I, I guarantee you the next time we talk to Chris, or if you want to reach out to Chris, he will have that answer for you. He's that kind yeah. of guy. My understanding was it's the same test vehicle they use at 100 volts. So, okay. I'll, but I'll I'll verify that. And again, 1500 volts at a thousand hours is is very, very respectable. I, uh, I, I I think we're going to see a lot more of this material in space applications because there's a lot of electronics going into space these days. Uh, electric vehicles, un, under hood, uh, in non-electric vehicles. Um, there's just a lot of, a lot of applications to put electronics in areas that might need higher operating temperature. Yeah. I imagine Dominic was just worried about specmanship, right? Is the 1500 volts for a thousand hours 
marketing. And, you know, in, in fact, the electric gradient wasn't all that high because these vias were 10 miles apart. I yeah, think that's, 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 that's a very valid question because, yeah, if you space the vias. And, and by the way, this is why CAF wasn't an issue, you know, a dozen years ago, because we have more spacing between the conductors. Yeah. But now that the conductors are getting closer, you know, now we're seeing that migration, you know, of copper uh, grow filaments between the circuits. Now, there are other things that have to happen. You need a pathway. You need some moisture in the material. You need a, you need a, a significant electrical bias, um, you know, to create these filaments. By the way, you can do this galvanically with two different metals. That's a whole nother subject for a whole nother... <laughs> For a whole nother webinar, but yeah, there there are some interesting things that can happen in in between in the materials between metals and and, and dielectrics. So all right, well, what do you have for us next? So, uh, in the world of of, uh, of film dielectrics, um, and this is just kind of a, a chart that shows some of the electrical properties and some of the mechanical properties uh, between materials. Of course, on the left hand side, we have FR four and low loss laminates. But then as you move right, we're talking about uh, film-based dielectrics or non-glass reinforced uh, dielectrics. And, um, and you can see some of the, some of the properties. Now, the film-based dielectrics are traditionally used in flex, uh, although I have worked with customers on combining them with rigid materials. Now, you, of course, when you do that, I'm not talking about a rigid flex, where you have very deliberate, flexible, and rigid sections. I'm talking more about a rigid PCB that might have film dielectrics in its makeup. You know, we've, we've seen that. Um, but in the world of flex, um, just like we have prepregs in rigid, you know, cores and prepregs in rigid, we have uh, copper clad films and then we have adhesives in the flex world. I mean, and the adhesives are not listed here, but they are higher loss. They're in the loss range of FR4. And um, the acrylic adhesives that we've used for years, they're, they're very sticky, they're very flexible, um, but they do have some limitations. So there's a new product out, and that's part of the reason why we wanted to have this webinar today is to introduce some new stuff, uh, the HP adhesive. So what's, so the, this, what's this new Pyrolux HP? So it, it's an, a, a low loss epoxy system. Uh, like a lot of flex materials, it has some thermoset and thermoplastic properties, you know, so it stays flexible. Uh, but you can see the DK and the loss are very respectable. 2.8 DK and a loss of 0035. That's when an order of magnitude over FR4. Yeah, and, and the acrylic adhesive, right? So, so if you, um, and it's got better thermal performance. So it, it has a lot, of, a lot of upside compared to what's been traditionally available. We're starting to stock this in both Southern and Northern California. And we're sampling our fabricator customers uh, with it. Uh, I, say fabric, I say sample, we, customers have also built finished boards out of this. So it's, it's past that point. But if someone wants to try it out, you know, and they're new to it, they can, they can get samples from us. Uh, but when you compare it with AP, because AP has a very uh, respectable uh, loss tangent, uh, you get into the same electrical space as LCP and some of the PTFEs, and it's a whole lot easier to fabricate. It, it makes it a lot more traditional in fabrication. But we're also using it with paste interconnects, and it could, there's no reason why you can't use it in, in some cavity constructions because this is a, a, a no-flow product. It, it will bond in the Z-axis, but it won't flow in the X and Y. Hmm. So it's got some, some really, uh, really cool potential out there, you know, as a, as a lower loss building block. In, in rigid flex designs where you have a three layer strip line, uh, and you need high speed cabling between those two rigid portions. It, it's good for that. It's good for a lot of different applications. What about its CTE? So its CTE is comparable to uh, the LF adhesive. It's a tad lower because it's, um, its TG is higher, but it's not going to be like a, uh, you know, like a um, heavily filled glass reinforced, you know, uh, rigid system. It's going to be higher than that. Um, but it does, that doesn't mean it won't work. Interesting. All right. What's next, sir? Oh, I love, are these scanning electron microscope images? I love yeah. these. Yeah, so yeah these, are, these are SEM photos. 
So um, there's a lot of talk about substrate scale technology out there in HDI. And I wanted to uh, let the folks on the call know that there are some good building blocks to make this make this a reality. Um, so are we looking are we looking at traces that have like a 10 to 1 aspect ratio vertical to horizontal? Whoa. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, Chris, you're a madman. Well, so, yeah, so, so one of the limitations with, with printing and etching, uh, which again, very heavily used in the industry is, you know, when you're etching, you know, it's a chemical process, you're etching in three dimensions. So you're etching laterally as you're etching down. Um, and really what, what these additive processes do, and there's, there's a semi-additive process and then there's a modified semi-additive process. I'll, I'll describe those two in a little bit. But really the difference here is, is we're using a photoresist, we're making a mold and we're plating in that mold. So we're not printing and etching, we're creating a, a, um, a mold out of the photoresist and we're filling that mold with copper metal. And the advantage of that is, is the photoresist can be imaged in a much more vertical fashion than you can etch because the light can go through the resist and polymerize the resist. And then we develop away that trough and now we've got a place to plate the copper. So um, it just allows you to do things you can't do um, with um, with a traditional print etch. You know, so it, it's a good thing you didn't come to me first because I would have told you that's impossible. Don't even try it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's it's interesting because I have OEMs that want to order boards like this from our customer base, and and we're trying to, you know. Um, I don't want to say bring them up to speed because that's not fair to our customer base really is educate them that, Hey, we've got these tools, you know, that, that, you know, that you could utilize to do some of this. So there's, there's really two ways to do this. Veritech has a very good electrolysis copper technology. That's very adherent that you would play it on your dielectric of choice. And then you would add your, your photoresist and then you would electroplate. Uh, then we also supply thin foils on carriers. We have a, a, a six micron on an aluminum carrier and we've got a three micron on a peelable carrier. Because you can't handle these foils, you know, on their own. Yeah, that's too thin. So you would, yeah, you would laminate, image, and plate. And actually, after lamination, I, I skipped over a step. You'd peel off the carrier. And then, of course, the foil now is supported by the dielectric material. And then you can, um, you know, you can plate your, your geometry. And then you flash etch. You etch that, that very thin conductive layer, either in the case of the Averitec process or in the, uh, the foil process. Um, and then you've got your, your circuits and it opens up some interesting design possibilities. Wow. Okay. So incredibly high aspect ratio, very close together. These traces can be, um, that's interesting. So this is an example that, that, that I'm showing here on a 0.5 millimeter pitch. Um, I've got an example that's showing, uh, you know, a differential pair, basically two between on that pitch where you have a reasonable capture pad for your laser vias at six mils, you know, across, um, you know, there's no reason why you can't do this. Now there are a couple of challenges <clears throat> here. Uh, one is, you know, you have to make sure you choose the right prepreg to fill, fill those geometries, you know, as you do your buildup layers, but this is just showing something that that's possible, you know, where you have a differential impedance of 99 ohms and a reference impedance of 55, you know, with a construction like this. So I think we're going to see more of this in the future, um, you know, for a lot of different reasons. But there's always that challenge of trying to pack more into smaller spacing and meet the electricals. Okay, so I'm just trying to think through this. So forgive me if I if I misspeak here, but in the past, I typically would probably have preferred to do some broad broadside uh, coupled micro strip lines through a, a core layer, you know, build some foil up around it if uh, for that. But with these high aspect ratios, I can do broadside coupled same layer. Yes, you're broadside coupling the same Whoa. layer. And this is a strip line example, right? And so, from what I saw from those SEM yeah. um, photos earlier, I mean, it's so clean. There's so very little variation. I would have a very good uh, uh, TD, uh, TDR off of that. That Oh, I like this, Chris. Um, can, can I get a coupon? Oh, I want to build some stuff. <laughs> well, I can get, I can get some foil samples down to uh, Royal circuits and you guys could, you guys could try it out. All you need to yeah. do is create, you know, create the image and then plate. I mean, laminate the foil and plate. 
I like it. I've got an angry cat in the background. Sorry, folks. I'm going to mute for a sec. Chris, tell us more, or, or um, are we ready for questions? I'm, I'm ready for questions. I mean, I, I covered a lot of different uh, subjects. I do want to mention that we do have the TerraGreen 400G, which we're starting just starting to sample with customers. So some of the other things I've introduced today, we're, we're well past that point. You know, board, customers are building boards out of those materials. Um, but yeah, the TerraGreen 400G is coming out and, uh, and that's for your next level, like where you have really tight, you know, uh, lost budget. You're dealing with something like PAM4, where you're trying to squeeze a lot of data into, into these uh, in smaller, uh, you know, uh, voltage steps. Um, that's where that material will play. So, um, but yeah, um, yeah, if anyone has any questions. Yeah, we do have a few questions. And I notice a name that I've not seen in 20 years since I worked in an electron, electron momentum spectroscopy lab. Um, Greg Childers, I'm calling you out. You, uh, you were great, buddy. Uh, I hope that's the same, Greg. If it is, I hope you're doing well. Um, yeah, we do have three questions. Uh, first question, anonymous attendee. What are some examples of people using these new materials for purposes other than high-speed design? Uh, well, uh, one example um, on the HP, uh, HP epoxy adhesive is using it for the ormet layers. So uh, again, a subject for another webinar is where you use paste interconnects in the Z-axis. So you could build these different sublaminations of your PCB and then put them together at the end. Um, or you could build a uh, what we call a top hat construction where you have a small, like say, almost interposer PCB and then you laminate that to a, uh, a larger PCB that might have generic components on it, like power supply connector or other, other things on it, where the, the top hat is device specific and you use ORMET paste um, and without getting into all the different things about ORMET technology, but basically it's a sintering, low temperature sintering paste that doesn't melt at assembly temperatures. So you, when you bond it, it melts at one temperature, but then it creates a, a metal with a higher melting point. Um, the HP adhesive would be ideal for applications like that because it has to have good adhesion and low flow characteristics and, and the HP has got both. So that's one non-high speed application for HP. Another would be cavity boards. If you're building a board, a PCB and you need a, a, a cavity for, for some reason, um, whether you're embedding something or you're creating some sort of special antenna or whatever, and you need that cavity, um, that's an application. In the case of the IS-550H, I mean, you know, basically that was, that was developed for high power systems. Um, so, you know, um, you know, power management and battery interconnect systems for electric vehicles would be an example. All right, uh, we, do, we have two other questions in Q&A, one that I will answer for everybody. Uh, the other ones I think we're going to have to ask you. And then one in chat that I'm going to bring over that I think is going to make you laugh because we talked about that about an hour or I don't know, about two, three hours ago when we chatted earlier today. Um, question is, are you aware of any fab houses stateside that are doing semi-flex boards? This is not the same as rigid flex, but similar at a lower cost. Um, would you like me to take that or would you like it, Chris? Um. It's up to you. I could take I could take that. We we did have a material called Superflex, and basically that was thin glass reinforced laminate that um, that had a high ductility copper foil on it. Um, that was offered in a variety of resin systems. Um, not real popular. I don't know why, uh, but it's typically the bend to install where you you have a very wide bend radius, so you're not creating any kind of a crease. Um, as far as I know, it's still available, but it's just not popular. So right now uh, we don't stock that material. Um, I, oddly enough, the PPO systems are more flexible than epoxy. So they would be good candidates for, for a semi-flex type construction. I don't know, Mark, if you want to add anything to that. Uh, I would just add that, yeah, Rigid flex is a pretty expensive technology. Uh, if you can get away with it, do flex with stiffeners. It's far cheaper. Uh, our shops in Southern California can probably help you out with that anonymous attendee. But since we don't have your name, we have no way to reach out to you. So you have to reach out to us. Um, but 
shoot me an email. We'll, that'll be up on uh, in two slides, and I'll get you connected. Um, okay. Next one is that I'll just get out of the way. Will you share the PowerPoint with the participants? Yes. Uh, actually, Chris, that's going to be up to you since this is uh, your data. Is that something we can share? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. So I'll make sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think that would be best through through you guys. You we will, yeah, we will share yeah. it with your permission, and we will also post this entire uh, presentation within two business days at our blog, and we'll give you uh, the the information on that on the last slide as well. Now, um, next question, and I think you we were talking about this a couple hours ago. Are you seeing a demand for extremely high tinsel strength north of seventy megapascals in films for rigid with ultra low DF? Uh, the short answer is no. Um, I'd have to look at the numbers. I know the polyimid films are pretty, they have pretty high tensile strength. So I believe they're in that range. Um, so I think they would, they would fit that, that parameter. And then Tim, uh, another one where it's probably best if you email us, um, you know, you start getting into military applications and all that, and it's stuff that it's difficult for us to give complete answers on. Um, I, it could be downhole stuff, which we're very familiar with. Uh, just 70 millipascals is just, it's raising an eyebrow. We had a similar conversation earlier. So I hope that answers your question. And lastly, unless there's any other questions, Thomas would like to know, is there a comparator sheet that includes CTE for multiple land cycle, less than five mil HDI boards? I, I don't have any data where it compares CTE side by side with every construction and the materials. Um, I will tell you that most materials have a CTE in the Z axis between 40 and 60 parts per million per degree Celsius below their T sub G. Um, that will vary though by glass to resin ratio. So the example I had on the previous slide where you had the one ply 2116, that will have a lower CTE than the two ply 1067. So it's not easy to compare different materials if you're not comparing individual constructions and that would be you know, beyond a laundry list. Um, just know that the neat resin is always higher than the composite. And uh, if you have to be concerned with CTE, you should uh, try and inc increase the glass content. But again, that's all, that's all with caveats. Um, I'm sorry, what was the other part of that question? I was talking about the CTE. No, I think they just really wanted a, um, they just wanted a comparator sheet or maybe a spreadsheet that talked about the different things. Yeah, so if you go by the data sheet listed CTE, you can end up with something very different than a real PCB. Uh, and it really has to do with, with the requirements of the design to properly encapsulate and bond all the circuits. Um, if you end up with a lot of resin in your design for those reasons, you're going to have a higher CT than, you, than what the data sheet says and what you expect. And it's true of all materials. It's not unique to, to the materials that we're talking about. The one exception would be the Pyrolux AP, which is basically capped on film based. That's going to that's not going to change by construction because, you know, there's no glass. Interesting. Okay. Um, <coughs> next question. Uh, Felipe asks, is there a tool out there to estimate the stack up thickness, which takes into account raw material and copper coverage? The answer is yes. Um, but you probably, I don't know if it's going to be in any of the commercial EDA softwares. Um, one of the nice things about working with your fab house is they have a long history of data sheet versus reality. And I know at Royal, we take into account um, past experience to get better estimates on what's going to actually come out of, of the finished package. Um, and we'll even provide, I mean, it's, it's a free service, you know, we'll create your, your stack up for you and you'll see the thickness estimated versus actual, um, that all that type of stuff, because you need that for the impedance control. Um, but we use proprietary software. It was built for us. You're not going to be able to buy it anywhere. Um, there are other ones, polar, 
Does Polar yeah, take Polar, that new into Polar account? Has, Polar has a stack up tool. Isola has one on their website. Um, it's not as good as what you guys do um, because you guys have the actual experience. You know, uh, just just to add to what you said, Mark, is, you know, we have scale flow thicknesses for the prepreg after lamination. That's assuming no fill. Mm -hmm. So you guys, and, and, and the, the reality is, is we can't cover every design attribute, right? So you guys have much better, with your experience, you have much better calculators for, for working out the stack up, you know, the stack up uh, and, and what the final thickness will be and what the, uh, what the requirements are to get uh, proper fill. Yeah. Um, just so you know, we've got two full-time employees that do this for us. I mean, that's their whole job. Um, one of them has been in the industry for, I, I don't even really know, and I don't want to over or underestimate. So I'm going to go with 30 to 35 years. Um, it could be as low as 25. It could be a little more. I don't know, but she, she's been doing this since the eighties sometimes. Um, with that level of experience, uh, you just have to take advantage of it. You're, you're not going to get that yourself. So, and it's free. I mean, we're not going to charge you. There's no commitment afterwards. If you want us to make you stack up, get in touch and we'll do it. All right. That concludes our questions. Would you like to put up our contact info, Chris? Oh, sure. Sorry about that. No, no worries. All right. If you have any questions following this webinar, please email sales at aapcb.com or C Hunrath, C H U N R A T H at insulectro.com. And we'll get them answered for you. Sales will figure out what your question is and the best employee to answer it. Sometimes that's routed to me, or if it's a stack up question, that'll get routed to Teresa, that type of thing. Uh, other than that, remember your webinar coupon. It is webinar 2021, and you can use that to get $500 off a turnkey application. Chris Hunrath, um, I've said it before, I say it again, it's not a compliment, it's the truth. You are a walking encyclopedia of material science. And if any of our professors that are on right now, um, and I see a few of you, if any of you guys would like to do some experiments with uh, any of these new latest greatest materials, Royal would love to talk to you. Um, Maybe we can partner or we do have a research and development department that can work with you on your thing, um, get you out the door with, you know, we, we understand how educational and research budgets work. Sometimes we just give it to you. Um, you know, we, we do ask you pay for shipping. That's about it. So if anybody in the education space is out there is interested and we can work with you, let us know. We'd be happy to. Chris, anything else? Yeah, just uh, you just reminded me. Um... We're working on a new buried resistor technology I need to talk to you folks about. So more to come on that. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, it's been a pleasure, Chris. It is always a pleasure. I hope to talk to you again soon. And everybody else, we'll see you at the next webinar. Take care. Bye.